there's these two pathways, omega-3 pathway, omega-6 pathway. There's another idea out there, Bill, that if you have too much linoleic acid, and this kind of comes back to the ratio, I think, in some regards, if you have too much omega-6 linoleic acid, it could have a, a negative effect on the omega-3 pathway. It could reduce the conversion of ALA, this short-chain omega-3, into EPA and DHA, and maybe, maybe so, so maybe indirectly high omega-6, high lin linoleic acid in intake is a problem because of the effects it has on the omega-3 pathway. What would you say to someone that's that's come across Yeah, that? there's a little bit of evidence for that, that um, you can suppress the conversion of ALA to EPA at least. Uh, there's very little conversion of ALA to DHA, but to EPA, yeah, there's a, um, I mean, I, I can understand that argument. Uh, and I don't think it's I don't think it's terribly compelling. Partly because simply because, the, the, number one, the world does not revolve around the omega three fatty acids. All health is not about omega three. As much as I love omega three fatty acids, it, it, just because let's let's say just to grant the point, let's say your higher higher linoleic acid is suppressing the your, your conversion i mean i'm always an advocate for eating epa and dha preformed anyway so i don't care about the pathway they can you know you can suppress it all you want but even if you did if on the other hand the linoleic acid you're eating that's maybe slowing down production of epa if that linoleic acid itself has 75 different beneficial effects they completely overpower what little change you're getting in the omega three. Well, then at the end of the day, you're better off. You know, so I, I don't. I, I it's easy to say anything that lowers omega three is bad, but that's not always the case. That's you just can't be that simple minded about things. Um, you got to look at the whole picture, which is again back to your your point about total mortality, heart disease diabetes, stroke, et cetera, et cetera. Is it possible, Bill, that in some of these studies looking at inflammatory markers that you don't see an increase in inflammation when you expose people to more linoleic acid or seed oils because the baseline diets are already so high in linoleic acid? Well, I mean, they've also looked at removing linoleic acid <laughs> From the diet, you know, you know, go both ways. You know, take a regular diet and add more. Take a regular diet and subtract it. And when they subtract it, it still doesn't lower inflammatory markers. Um, so so it, it, both ways it works. I mean, the other the other point I think is worth making is just because you're eating more linoleic acid doesn't mean you're getting more arachidonic acid. And that's been very clearly shown. That whether you triple or quadruple the amount of linoleic acid or you reduce it by half or 80%, when the people go and then look at the change in the plasma arachidonic acid levels, one of the products of linoleic, it's absolutely flat. It doesn't respond at all to the changes in linoleic acid intake. So that's one of the, one of the false pillars of this whole argument that the more linoleic you eat, the more arachidonic you get. That's not true. And even then, based on what you were saying earlier, that wouldn't necessarily mean a negative health outcome because that arachidonic acid is a precursor to a number of different compounds, some that could be pro-inflammatory, some that could be res inflammatory resolving. Or anti right, exactly, right. It's just, just far more complicated than, than people right. give the body credit with. And I, I know I'm repeating a few things that you say here, but that other review that I sent you, yesterday that you sent back to me um just reiterates what you just said then and, and i want to make sure people have this in the show notes and on screen if you're watching on youtube um and i'll quote so it's, it says human clinical trials have also investigated the effect of adding or removing energy from dietary linoleic acid on tissue arachidonic acid concentration a systematic review of 36 randomized controlled trials showed that decreasing linoleic acid in the diet by 90% was not correlated with a reduction in tissue arachidonic acid concentration in metabolically healthy humans. In addition, increasing dietary linoleic acid by sixfold was not correlated with an increase in tissue arachidonic acid concentration 
Therefore, the current human research evidence shows that linoleic acid does not affect inflammation. Well, it does not affect arachidonic acid levels. And if arachidonate's the bad player, then it doesn't make any difference. You're not, linoleic is not driving inflammation through arachidonate, for sure. You know, and there are a lot of, it's very interesting, there are, are molecules in the blood that are anti-inflammatory. I'm like, there's a, a thing called nitrosylated linoleic acid. So a, a linoleic acid molecule with an NO2 group, or NO, I'm not sure what's an NO or NO2, but a nit nitrate group attached to it, that circulates in the blood. And actually, nitric oxide, we all kind of know the story about a nitric oxide. It's a very good vasodilator. And, and one of the primary ways that nitric oxide is carried in the blood is through attachment to linoleic acid. And so here's a molecule that hardly anybody ever measures. But those who have looked at it say, oh, wow, this thing is, is, is really anti-inflammatory, vasodilatory, healthy molecule, and it's, and it's carried on linoleic acid. So that kind of story can play out a hundred times in things we just haven't discovered yet, where linoleic may be doing this, 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 and this, and we just don't know it. But at the end of the day, people are living longer. <laughs> right. It's coming back to kind of uh, close the circle on omega-6 to 3 ratio here. So if there is a, a kind of physiological theoretical explanation for high omega-6 intake, perhaps suppressing some ALA into EPA. But what, what I'm hearing from you is that really, if someone has optimized EPA and DHA intake, and we've done episodes on this, so they're eating enough fatty fish per week and or supplementing with EPA and DHA, then that that idea of, of suppression of converting short chain omega-3s to long chain becomes redundant um, in that in that context. So so top of the list would be rather than than kind of focusing time and energy on omega-6 to 3 ratio would just be optimize omega-3 intake and omega-3 index. Um, is there any other reason at all to consider the omega-6 to 3 ratio or is this something that we really – you know, th should just be thoroughly thrown out. Well, I think it should be thoroughly thrown out. I've been making that case for 10 years. Um, variety of reasons. Number one, when you say omega-6 and omega-3, you're not being very specific about which fatty acids you're talking about. Because again, there are several omega-6s, there are several omega-3s. And without a, a specific designation about EPA, DHA versus ALA, you, the, the ratio is meaningless. Uh, because you can have, uh, you know, obviously th the same ratio with all the omega-3s being EPA and DHA or all the omega-3s being ALA, and you get a completely different physiologic outcome. Uh, that's one problem. Number two, second problem with it is you can have high levels of omega-3 and high levels of omega-6 and have the same ratio as having really, really low levels of omega-6 and omega-3. So the ratio doesn't help you with that. Uh, Thirdly, it, it, the ratio implies that the omega sixes are bad, and we've been we've been over that, uh, and we, we beat that horse to death here, and, and so that's the problem. So it's if you want to correct your omega six omega three ratio, do it by eating more EPA and DHA. That's the the message that unfortunately can come from focusing on a ratio is you think that oh, I can just lower my omega six intake, and I'll improve my ratio but you'll also be less healthy. If you improve your ratio by raising your EPA DHA intake, you'll be more healthy. So the ratio is a real distraction from the real focus, which to me is what's your omega-3 level, EPA DHA. Yeah, it feels like a distraction because it's like that omega-3, omega-6, you know, uh, anti-inflammatory, pro-inflammatory pathway. If you, do a, if you run a quick search online and say uh, omega-6 to 3, ratio nuts and seeds you'll see these these like images and tables and and all sorts of information that's talking about like getting a, a, an optimal four to one ratio and that means that you should eat chia seeds and not almonds and pumpkin seeds and that just seems like a, a huge distraction firstly like almonds and pumpkin seeds are are likely very healthy but it seems it just seems like a huge distraction from what you're saying which is get your epa and dha right and then 
you know, any of these nuts and seeds, you know, seem to fall within a, a group of foods that that are health promoting. <laughs> So I, yeah, I mean, I'm all in favor of nuts and seeds. I mean, go for it. But just don't worry about the omega-6, omega-3 stuff. Just get your EPA and DHA and then eat your nuts and seeds too. That's fine. Lately, I've been thinking a lot about toxin exposure. And one thing that I've been paying close attention to is PFAS, or these so-called forever chemicals. They're found in things like non-stick cookware, waterproof clothing, food packaging, and even our drinking water. And they don't break down in the body. Research links them to endocrine disruption, metabolic issues, and perhaps even various types of cancer. I have a scientist coming on the podcast soon to unpack all of this, but in the meantime, I've been using Function Health to test my own PFAS exposure. Function is an all-in-one platform offering over 100 advanced lab tests, including tests you'll be familiar with from this show that we've spoken about like ApoB and LP little a, and now PFAS. That is about five times more testing than you would get in a standard physical. Most of us have some level of PFAS in our bodies due to the environment that we live in. The question is how much? If levels are high, testing gives you the knowledge to make changes like filtering your water or switching to PFAS free products. Function is easy to use with 2000 plus lab locations across the United States and a membership that's just $499 per year. No supplements, no prescriptions, just real unbiased health data. Head to functionhealth.com forward slash Simon Hill to get started. That's functionhealth.com forward slash Simon Hill to get started today.